Okay, so we are in Exodus 11. Just to recap really quickly, so last week at the end of chapter 10, we had the, we had the ninth plague, we had the plague of darkness, uh, we had Moses, this, this little back and forth between Moses and Pharaoh, we're winding that whole thing down. We've had this back and forth now for uh, several plagues, and we're getting to the end of that. The end of chapter 10, we have the, the, the scene where the, the darkness after three days, and Moses comes and talks to Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh ends by saying, get away from me, take care never to see my face again, for on that day you see my face, you shall die. Moses says, as you say, I will not see your face again. So it's less than cordial, but at that point, we think everything's done. We get into chapter 11, and I want to actually read, if you have your Bibles with you, I want to read chapter 11. It's only 10 verses. So let's, let's do that here. Um, shouldn't take very long. What I want you to kind of think, of, think through here, though, some of these events are a little bit out of order, and so I wanted to talk through this. The first three verses here, that we're going to come across, well, we'll get to that at the end. We don't even need that right now. The, the first three verses that we're going to read here describe what happened before what we just talked about in chapter 10, before being summoned to, to hear Pharaoh's last kind of offer there. So let's read verses 1 through 3 of chapter 11. The Lord said to Moses, Yet one, one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So this, this conversation between the Lord and Moses happened prior to the plague of darkness and the, dis, the discourse that went back and forth between Moses and Pharaoh at that point. So then we get into this speech by Moses in verses 4 through 8, which from what I've read, my understanding is this actually takes place between, if you flip over to chapter 10, between verses 26 and 27. So in verse 26, Moses is saying, no, not only us, but our livestock, we all have to go. Because remember, that was Pharaoh's condition. You can go, leave your livestock. Remember, you wiped out ours. We want to keep those. We need those. Moses says in verse 26, no, we're taking all of them. Not a hoof shall be left behind. So before we pick up in 27, I want to read. I'm sorry, I got you flipping back and forth. I want to read Exodus 11, beginning in verse 4. So Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight, I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the bandmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been heard, nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and and Israel, and all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, you and all the people who follow you, and after that I will go out, and after that I will go out. Uh, and he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. So if you look over in chapter 10 there, in verse 27, after saying that, well, before he left in hot anger, but, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so in, that's Pharaoh's response to this. He would not let them go. And that's when Pharaoh says, get away from me. You'll, you, I don't want to see your face again. So they both leave in kind of this, this heated state. Uh, finishing up chapter 11 in verse 9, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all the wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. So Moses says, as you say, I will not see your face again. He went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Again, I feel like we've asked this before, but 
Why? Why? Why would Moses be angry about something that he knew was going to happen, that God told him over and over, Pharaoh's not going to listen to you? In that moment, why is, why is Moses, why is he so worked up? Maybe he was aware of the impact it was going to have on, on um, but that's a good point. So she mentioned, she said some of the innocent people, and I think you're referring to the, some of the Egyptians when you say that. There's a, there's a change here where the Egyptians are starting to push back on their leadership and starting to say, what have you gotten us into? Why aren't you letting these people go? And what we even read later is that some of the Egyptians, I believe, leave with the Israelites uh, during the Exodus. So maybe Moses is aware of what's to come and it's just frustrating to him. Uh, it, it's frustrating. He's, he's gone back and forth, I don't know how many times now. Is it, is it after every plague? So is this the ninth time? Um, and he's just like exhausted. Any other ideas? Any other thoughts on that? Almost, he's, 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 I could be. I could see it being frustrating, being asked to do something, knowing you weren't going to get the results that you hoped for, just personally. And also, there is that you're just dealing with somebody that is so hard-headed; they're just unwilling to see what you see is is reason. You've you've gone through these things, you've shown them the power of God, and still, it's like. Is it something I've done? Is it, did I drop the ball here? Yeah. Eric said, yeah, I told you I couldn't do this. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Will? Oh, yeah, starts to look inward and say, what am I doing? Maybe doubt, yeah. Um, yeah, so he's just, he's, he's angry. Pharaoh is angry. And they've gotten kind of the tipping point here. And so we're going to talk about this, uh, this final plague here in just a minute. I did want to reference, we see this language quite a bit. We see the, the idea of going back and forth here between Egypt's firstborn as we get into plague number 10 versus Jehovah's firstborn. We, we hear God um, reference his firstborn quite a bit here, which is whom? I'm sorry. That wasn't what I was looking for, but that's probably accurate too. So I heard. So he references, and so this is chapter. So this is Exodus chapter four. And the Lord said to Moses, "When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. When you shall say to Pharaoh." Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn, and I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. For if you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. He says this back in chapter 4. What's, what's the, what, talk, to, talk to me about the contrast here between the firstborn. 
in, in most cultures, what's the significance of the firstborn? They get the inheritance. They're, they're considered special to some degree, right? Uh, they receive, like I said, they receive the inheritance. In Egypt, my understanding is they were considered sacred. Especially special. Um, but what had Pharaoh tried to do to God's firstborn? And when we say firstborn in this case, we're talking about... That child is just staring at me. It's adorable. I'm sorry. It's distracting. You did that on purpose, didn't you? <laughs> um, so when we say firstborn, God's people, uh, the, the Israelites here, what had Pharaoh, how, he had, how had he treated them? Enslave them, and then specifically, what did he, how did we start this story? Trying to kill them, trying to kill the Jewish male babies. Um, they were enslaved. We see examples of their officers uh, brutally mistreating the slaves. You could argue that God was paying Pharaoh back in his own currency. You're going to mistreat, you're going to kill my people, my firstborn. You're going to get that paid back to you. Pharaoh drowned the Jewish babies. Jehovah drowns Pharaoh's army. We see that the idea of compensation is fundamental in life. Uh, Christ said in Matthew 7, For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Pharaoh gets back what he has sown here when it comes to the firstborn, uh, God's firstborn. Remember, Israel had been in Egypt for, at this point, over 400 years. The people were enslaved for much of that time, meaning they didn't have anything to pass down. They didn't have an inheritance to pass down. But in God calling Israel his firstborn, he's indicating that he will keep that promise that he made to Abraham. We read also in uh, chapter 11 here a little bit about this idea of coming out of the land with great possessions. Uh, once again, speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for, uh, for silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people the Lord gave the people favor. I read that to mean, whatever you want, we will do it for you. Not necessarily, we, we really, we've really come to like you as a people. Uh, so we're happy to share with you what we can. I think it's, they, they realized what was going on. Uh, why do you think God, we touched on this a little bit. Why do you think God had his people do this? Go to the people of Israel and ask for silver and gold jewelry. I think another place also mentions clothing, too, another passage. What was the purpose of that? What's that? Okay, so the people didn't know this, but eventually it would be used to furnish the, the, the tabernacle and the clothing for um, the priests and everything like that. Anything else? You would need a lot of the skins and things as well. Yeah. Yeah. They they carried they carried a lot a lot with them. Why would so we touched on this a little bit too, but why would the Egyptians be inclined to do so? I came up to you, Derek, and said, Nice car, let me have your car. And you say, Yeah, take it. Yeah. Why would David?
And was this, I almost laugh at the question, was this fair? Like, is this fair to the Egyptian people? Does this fair matter? So the victor go the spoils. It was seen as probably collecting unpaid wages, I would imagine, too, for years of, of slavery. Um, we have some back pay owed to us. We're just gonna we're just gonna take it now. Yep. Right. So they they started off in prominence. They were given land. They were given titles. They were given. Uh, they they developed their wealth, and all that was gone by this point. So they were kind of taking it back, right? Uh, and. whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Uh, Genesis 15, Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Again, a continued fulfillment of the promise of God to his people upholding that promise. Uh, before we get into chapter 12, there's a lot that happens in chapter 12. We have the institution of the Passover, we have the 10th plague, and then we actually have the exodus from Egypt take place all in chapter 12. Before we get there, any comments, any other thoughts on chapter 11? Mike? No, no, I said 11. You can't go back to 10. Sorry. Yes. sensed it. Yeah. It, you feel like you get to the point where Pharaoh's the only one that has this opinion, and it reminds me of Proverbs 16, pride goes before destruction, haughty spirit before fall. That was Pharaoh. That was Pharaoh to a T. Well, I, yeah, I, I wish, and I don't know if anybody knows this, I would be interested to know what the Egyptian population was at this time. We know roughly the Jewish population had grown to close to 2 million. We know there's 600,000 men. We kind of build that out to a numbers I've seen about 2 million. How did that compare to Egypt? I have no idea. They had, they had become a problem kind of led to the slavery to begin with. Uh, any other comments before we go to chapter 12? Okay. So chapter 12, we learn all about the Passover, the inaugural Passover. Uh, before we get into it, uh, for those of you that did read ahead, can anybody sh explain or share any of the details that are described in how they are to keep this, this inaugural Passover? Before I put all the answers up on the board? Do you want to show that you read it? You, you what? I appreciate that, Pam. Thank you. Yes. 
There was a lot of unleavened bread. There's, there's seven days worth, yes. A lot of unleavened bread. So, it is very spelled out. It is very specific. What we also learn, well, let me just pull up some of it. So, what we learn as this is being instituted is the calendar for the people is starting now. It's starting with this Passover feast. And, and so as we read forward, and there'll be some other date markers throughout the Exodus, we're able to kind of understand how long they've been in uh, they the trip to Sinai, how long they've been at Sinai. A lot of it is based on knowing that the calendar is starting, the clock's ticking with this Passover. We read that they are instructed to have one lamb per household, that that lamb gets selected on the 10th day. And again, at this time, that's when it was selected, and that's what it will be going forward. So it's selected on the 10th day. It was killed on the 14th day at twilight, which actually the evening starts uh, the Passover in the evening. We read that they put blood around the door from that lamb. We read that it's roasted that night. There was to be nothing left over in the morning, and that it was established as a memorial going forward. It's something that they would remember going forward. So it was tactical for the events of that night and what they were going to be doing, but it was also generational as a reminder going forward. Uh, did anybody catch, anybody note the, the manner in which they were supposed to eat and what its significance was? Like it's, it's even described like how they were to go about eating. Exactly. Is that, uh, I think, verse 11. Um, let's see. Yeah. In this manner you shall eat, uh, you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste, for it is the Lord's Passover. What does all that imply? What's the significance of that, that ready position? There's no, t yeah. There's no time. Don't get comfortable. You're not kicking back at the table. You're going to eat this, and you're going to go, and you're going to take care of the remains. There aren't going to be anything left over for the next day. Uh, you're going to go. Today, obviously, this is still celebrated. In the Bible, we read, I think it's the next chapter, chapter 13. This is referred to as the month of Abib. Uh, coming, my understanding is coming out of exile the name of that month is now Nisan, uh, which is the first month of the religious calendar for the Jews, uh, even to this day. It begin, begins on the 15th day, which again would be in, in the evening. The Passover includes this, this time period, this Feast of Unleavened Bread for so, so many days. They're only to eat unleavened bread. In fact, it says to purge leaven from your house completely, not to have it anywhere. It has significance, and in this case, it doesn't have good significance. Don't even have it anywhere in the house. And we just finished this, actually. Jews just finished celebrating this, uh, I guess last night, they would have concluded. Uh, so it changes a little bit every year according to the calendar, but again, this is something that is still a memorial. It's still uh, upheld by uh, the Jewish people. Um, one of the things, I, and I might be just kind of making a stretch here, one of the things I thought about, they kill the lamb, and they're told to wipe the doorpost with blood. And this is to, again, we, we haven't really touched on this, but this is angel of the Lord's coming, um, going to kill the firstborn. If you do this, you will be protected. It wasn't enough for them to simply kill the lamb, have faith that they were going to be taken care of. God gave them a very specific instruction of what to do with that, with the blood, take action with that. And I don't, I don't know if there's any significance you know, to our kind of call to action today. It's not simply enough just to kind of say you believe we're given specific instructions, we're given action to take the next step with that. God had them do something with that blood to signify. And God knew who they were. God knew where they were. He didn't need them to mark it. 
Zach. And I think it was, I forget which plague it started with, plague number three maybe or something, where there started to be a distinction between God's people. It's, it's, it's very clearly spelled out. So we're speculating, but right, I, I think you're right. The Egyptians at some point would have started to catch on to this. There was a difference between those people and us. And this was just kind of the, the ultimate. We lost not only first, firstborn children, firstborn cattle, Firstborn of everything, from Pharaoh down to the slave, you know, the slave girl, it says, everybody lost a firstborn. So this would have been, yeah, a, a, a really, uh, a really big deal. Yep. There's, he said, the lesson, there's a lesson of obedience. I mean, there's a lot of instruction there, right? Get this lamb, take care of it, get ready, get girded up, get, you know, get everything ready, and be ready to go. Very specific instructions. You're right, there's, there's a call to obedience. But they need it, yeah. David, did I see I like that. This makes me one of the one of the thoughts Corey and I had after doing this first time was let's just redo the whole thing built around a handful of themes because there are some really powerful themes that emerge. Of course, we didn't do that. So, but I appreciate some of those coming out in this conversation. One of the first times his people were saved by blood. That's where I'm going right now. That's a perfect segue. Thank you. We are saved by the blood of the Lamb. So, the question, what's the connection? How does this story of the Exodus, how does this point to Christ? Similarities, differences?
Yeah. I, yes, I, I agree. I think one of the points that comes out of that is that idea of, of, of deliverance, right? It's, it's deliverance. It's, it's deliverance from slavery. In Egypt, it was physical. For us, it's spiritual. It's sin. It's slavery of sin. But we're being delivered by the blood of Christ. Uh, we're delivered, the deliverance to worship the living God in spirit and truth. How many times, I think there's at least, at least three or four times where it expressly states the idea of let the people come out to the wilderness to serve me. There's this idea of service that needs to take place. Um, people being delivered uh, to worship God in spirit and truth. What about, I don't know if I, I'm scared to click this because I don't know if I'm going to give away answers or not. I can't remember what's next. Talk to me about the connections between the lamb in the Exodus and the lamb Christ. Without blemish, both excellent. What else? Yep. Without blemish, sacrificing blood. What else? What other similarities? Not guilty of anything. Completely innocent. else? Yeah. We read about this, this Lamb of the, of the household in Egypt. Paul calls Christ the Passover lamb, explicitly, uh, in 1 Corinthians. Lamb's blood saved us from physical death. Christ's blood saves us from spiritual. Mention innocent without blemish. No broken bones. Mention both places. One of the things that I thought was really interesting is the time of selection and death. Chosen on the 10th day, killed on the 14th. Christ enters Jerusalem on the 10th day. He's crucified on the 14th day. Um, both have references to hyssop. Again, some of these are just kind of reaching, right? But you see the, the, the parallels in some of these. There's references of not to, not to be there the next day. Don't let the lamb, don't let the lamb, you know, take, roast it that night. Don't let there be any leftover till tomorrow. We see in John 19, they go around, they don't want the, the bodies to be left the next day because it was the Sabbath, so they go around to break the legs and everything. That was that, that, was that night before. They don't want the body to carry over. Um, again, some of these might, I might be stretching, but there's a lot of, of similarities as we go, as we take a look at this and the, the commonalities. Bill? Good point. Good point. Commonalities between Moses and Christ. One of the other things we read about is this idea that no foreigner or hired worker may eat the Passover. God tells the people, as you keep this going forward, I think it's in uh, verse 46, why couldn't foreigners partake of the Passover feast with the Israelites? They did have to be, yes, they, it, it does say they can partake, but they're going to be circumcised. They're going to be all, all in. What's the significance of that? God calls them, God calls them his, his firstborn. They're a very select, chosen people. Um, you don't just kind of accidentally kind of dip in and out of that relationship. Very special relationship. 
we do read in verse 38, when they, when they, on this exodus, there's, my version says, a mixed multitude also went up with them. Uh, this could have been comprised of possibly Egyptians that intermarried or Egyptians that just wanted to get out and saw, saw a better way. Uh, we also, that, that, that same word, mixed multitude, is also referenced later in Numbers. It's referred to them as the rabble as well, this group that kind of complained a lot. And so I, I don't know the connection there, but there was this element um, that went with them. Sounds familiar. I have to look it up exactly where that is. It, yes, his wife. Yeah. And so, the, again, yes, the idea of just foreigners kind of showing up uh, were not to partake of the Passover. I, I almost, I, I, it, it's a bad, it, it's a bad comparison. But I almost think of. You have your traditional holidays, Thanksgiving. For us, it's like it's the traditional things, turkey, you know, those things. Imagine if you invite somebody else over and they're like, well, at, at our house when we have Thanksgiving, we, we use, we, we use uh, tofu. Is okay if I, I bring some? Um, it doesn't fly very well with your, it probably disrupts your entire tradition. Inviting somebody into something that was very special to you and your family uh, in this case, it opened up the opportunity to encourage them to participate in foreign festivals, in foreign practices. It started to um, it dilute the pureness of God's people. It gave it the opportunity. If you were to start allowing foreigners to partake in this special relationship without demonstration that they were willing to then adhere to all of the uh, requirements of that relationship, but this was, so this was something that they were required to maintain going forward. Okay, so at the end of chapter 12 here, we, let me read verse 33 here, beginning of verse 33. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. Yeah. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the, so the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders, People of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked for. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. So the Israelite group is marching out boldly, marching out of Egypt in full view of the Egyptians. Numbers 33 says, the Egyptians were in the process of burying their firstborn as Israel is leaving. They're still burying their dead and saying, please, take what you want, leave. Uh, just rounding up some of these numbers. So again, Joseph enters the land, about 70 people. The uh, Bible says 430 years to the day. I don't know how to take that exactly. But it's pretty, cl take that as you will. But so 430 years they've been in Egypt. They've grown to close to 2 million. They leave on approximately, uh, not even approximately, they leave on the 15th day of the first month. The calendar has started. This is approximately 1445, 46 BC. We read that they travel from Ramses to Succoth, uh, this, this land of Goshen that was theirs. Uh, I can't remember if I showed you last week or last time we talked where Goshen was, but it's actually uh, just at, just past Prospect and uh, down northeast of 265. Anybody know where yeah, Goshen? Yeah. No. Okay. Sorry. It so the the delta this land of Goshen um, was was very fertile. It was very good land. You see, it's kind of hard to see, but there's Ramses, and then they traveled. Uh, east, southeast to Succoth uh, that we read here. I would highly encourage, we run out of time here, 
Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen this. Um, Appian Media, who Jeremy DeHutt is like the tour guide for this, they've just released this little under two hour, it's a movie, it's a documentary movie, um, where Jeremy kind of takes you through the events of the Exodus in the locations that, that, that it happens. It's well worth watching. Um, so I would check that out when you get a chance. One of the things he talks about is that in that town of uh, what was what they think to be that town of Ramses, which was one of the store sites that was built, um, that there are actually Semitic artifacts, that they're Semitic, Asiatic in nature rather than Egyptian, um, kind of leading to proof that there were others there besides Egyptians, um, going back to Joseph's time as well. Uh, then there's, I think next week we're going to be talking about the Red Sea crossing. There's a section in here where he's out on a boat on the Red Sea, and you get an idea of the expanse uh, between mountain range and mountain range and what it would have taken to separate that. Uh, the context is just really fantastic. It gives you a new perspective. So I would recommend watching that uh, if you have the time. So at the end here, we're left, you know, for the last time, the people have left. Pharaoh's done with them. We think we're done with Egypt. i got to get one more out of this movie. i got to use one more, right? That's, a, that's, the, last, that's the last Exodus ref, movie reference you did. But, um, so we know what's going to happen. Uh, Corey's going to be talking about that next Wednesday. For, uh, chapter 13, ooh, 13 through 18. Corey's being ambitious. So chapters 13 through 18, the Red Sea and into the wilderness. Uh, we're going to start traveling, making that trek down to uh, Mount Sinai eventually. Uh, and you, well, I'm not going to ask you for any questions because it's time. Thank you.